There's an argument you sometimes hear that the Buddha said that suffering comes from resisting change. Therefore, there should be nothing wrong with changing the Dharma, changing the Vinaya. But that argument is wrong from the very beginning. The Buddha never said that suffering comes from resisting change. He says it comes from clinging. Which means that we have to turn around and look at what we're clinging to. We find that we're clinging to a lot of things we hold dear. And this is why the Dharma goes against the grain. The things that we hold to dearest, the Buddha says, that's your suffering. So the question is, are we going to give him a fair listen or not? Are we going to give his teachings a try or not? If we decide ahead of time that we don't like the teaching and we want to change it, how can we say that we give him the Dharma a test? The Buddha said he's not forcing the Dharma on anybody. He's offering it for a test. But to give it a fair test requires that you practice it as it's taught, and what the Buddha calls practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. That's how we wish our respect for the Buddha, that you know the story, the night that he was passing away. The devas were playing celestial songs, throwing down celestial flowers, flowers and incense. And the Buddha mentioned to the monks who were gathered there what was happening. He says, but that's not how you show respect to the Tathagata. You show respect by practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. Because he went to all that trouble to find the Dharma. He never made the Dharma up. There are a lot of people who say, well, we should refashion the Dharma to fit with our time and place. But the Buddha never fashioned the Dharma. He had to find it. As in that chant just now, there was this regularity to the Dharma. That's true whether the Buddha discovers it or not. But if he doesn't discover it for us, then we have no chance to practice it. So he went to all that trouble to discover it. And the texts tell us that he had the memory of many, many aeons, so he could see what other Buddhas had done in the past. And taking their example, he formulated the Vinaya. This was the part that he did formulate. And so it wasn't a fly-by-night, sort of, let's see what we can think of next kind of vinya or dharma. The dharma was there, and he uncovered it. And when we make changes to it, we're covering it back up again. He said that the dharma is akaliko, timeless. And the more we try to make it fit in with our time, the further we get away from its timeless quality. Because there is something about practicing the Dharma as best you can in line with what the Buddha taught that erases the time between then and now. You feel close to him. You feel close to all the people who practice at that time. And you're part of a long lineage of people who are close. I know when we first came here, there was a lot of pressure from our visitors that we had to change things. He said, now that you're in America, you have to do things the American way. I kept thinking about a John Fung's warning about people who go to foreign lands from Thailand to spread the Dharma. And what happens is that those foreign lands spread their defilements into the people who are supposed to be spreading the Dharma. So I told the people that here I am far away from my teachers. The only thing that keeps me close to them is the fact that I'm practicing in line with what they taught. I'm not trying to change things. And I want to be able to pass that on. And so by resisting that pressure, we've been able to survive. Because if our concern is trying to attract people here, then anything could change. None of us could live in peace. New people come and they make new demands. Well, we have to change this, change that. And 
the things we had learned get thrown away. I know when I first was ordained, I wasn't all that happy about all the rules. I kept looking at the books and saying, my gosh, there are more and more rules. The more you look, the more you find. But I began to realize that on the one hand, the rules are there to make you free. They've designed a community that people can respect. And people respect partly because they've seen it's lasted so long. And the community respects the Buddha. And so we get support that enables us to practice as much as we can. We don't have to worry about the typical things that lay people have to worry about. So it's free. And at the same time, it's designed for a very harmonious living. When things are clearly laid out, laid out like this, and they're not going to change, you know what to do. We need to know what to do on the external level, and it gives you more time to focus on what's wrong inside. Because that's where the real point of all the Dharma and all the Vinaya is, to point inside to where are you clinging. How can you develop some disenchantment for that clinging? Because that's what the Buddha said. When you're practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma, that's what it points to is disenchantment. The words go together. The word for clinging can also mean to feed. The word for disenchantment is when you realize you've had enough of a certain kind of food and you don't want any more. So we're working precisely on putting an end to our clinging. And so we find that our ideas, our views, run up against things in the Dharma. One, it's good to think of that teaching, I think it's the third Chan Patriarch. The Great Way is not difficult for those with no preferences. Now, he's not saying you shouldn't prefer skillful actions to unskillful actions. You shouldn't prefer the end of suffering to suffering. You should prefer these things. It's simply that when you figure out what has to be done, and then whether you like it or not, you're willing to do it. That's what it means to have no preferences. That's how you make the, the way easy for yourself. And it only stands to reason that if you're suffering from what your views are and what your idea of who you are is, in addition to sensuality and in addition to your ideas of how things should be done, then it's good to try what the Buddha recommended. Because he offers different views, different ways for doing things a different sense of self, but focused on the doing. Practicing generosity, practicing virtue, developing concentration, developing your discernment. He gives very clear instructions on how to do these things. And so we want to clear away all the encumberments that get in the way of really focusing where the problem is, our own clinging, our own feeding, things that we hold very dear. And if we can't let the things we hold very dear be challenged, there's no way we're going to get progress. So instead of rewriting the tradition, we should allow the tradition to rewrite us. The story of someone who used to create suffering and that learned how not to. And this is what we respect in the, the Ajans. And John Bunn did everything he could to follow the customs of the Noble Ones as best he could understand them. And that's how he trained all his students, not in terms of his, his own ideas about things, 
but from what he discovered through his own practice, the discernment he de had developed, not just through reading, not just through thinking things through, but actually putting the Dharma into practice. Having that kind of discernment, he was in a good position to teach others. He had changed his thoughts, his words, his deeds to fit in line with the Dharma. He gave them an, ex an example. We should allow ourselves to do the same so we can be a good example for the world. Because the best way to benefit from the Dharma, the best way to test the Dharma, is to follow it in line with the Dharma. Only then can you say that you've given a fair test. So however much the world may change, there's no reason for us to change with them. It's only then that we're going to be able to find the Dharma that's really timeless.